Well, it's about that um, time of year for a Honduras trip, right? November. They love to go in the rainy season. We're so thankful for the connection we have to Honduras and to send teams down there through BBI missions. So there are a few going down to build uh, coffee roasters and uh, an addition to a little church in a small village. So we want to pray for them that God would bless this trip, that God would protect them. So I'm going to ask Caleb and Carrie, I'm, I'm thinking who's going, Jim and Jason, to come on up. Mike is going as well, but we're going to pray for him. We heard that his neck is bothering him. He has a pain in the neck. No. So why don't we have some people come on up and lay hands on these here that we pray for God's protection. So if you feel called, come on up and let's lay hands on these guys here if you want to support them in that, in prayer. It's how we do it at Northgate. We're a big family. Laying hands on the Bible as people were sent out is very biblical, at least how I read the New Testament. Just wait a second. All right, let's pray together. Lord Jesus, as we've been singing and praying this morning, we know that you are in absolute control of everything. You are sovereign. You have planned this trip. It goes way back to the gospel going forward into this small village of Arianus years ago. It goes back to an idea to make coffee roasters, to bless people. And Lord, we see all of this coming together in this trip. So God, we're asking for your blessing, your protection. Lord, we know that as we step out in faith at times, there are spiritual battles. There are those pain in the necks we have to deal with. But Father God, we come together and ask that you would be victorious. That you would do what you want to do in the people's lives, but more importantly, in those who are going. We pray for strength and energy. Lord, every trip I seem to go on starts great, and there's a little challenge somewhere in the middle. So we pray for patience with people and each other. We pray for the fruit of the Spirit to rise when the pressure comes. We pray that as they go through customs with all these suitcases of coffee roasters, that they would see nothing and they would pass right through. There wouldn't be any hiccups or problems. And we even pray, God, that each one of those roasters will go to each farmer it's supposed to go. And each meeting and every time one is given, that there will just be a flow of your work and your spirit. And that it would bless for years to come. Yeah, we pray that the missionaries there would be blessed, Harmon and Karina. David and Megan, Lord, we pray for great fruit, but not for us, for your glory. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, kids, you are dismissed to Sunday school and adults, you can stand up and say hello to somebody. I know it's kind of up and down here. But we want you to welcome someone this morning.
Alrighty, we just have a few announcements. The first one is after the service, there is agape lunch. So please stay. I've heard there's a lot of food. So please stay um, and eat a meal with us. Following the lunch on December 22nd, if you are wanting to sing um, with the children and you are a good singer, well, even if you're not a good singer and you want to sing, um, there will be a practice downstairs um, that you can participate in. And then on December 1st at RCF, there is a United Christmas Worship Night, and Joel Williams and Stephen Schilke will be leading in that. And then on December 14th, there is a ladies' wreath making um, in the morning. There's still more details to come. And that is everything. What, what did you say? Oh, move that out of the way? Sorry, I, miss, I don't do well with the hand signals. What? <laughs> Hi. I just think it's amazing, just in the little bit of history that I know, that a few years ago, I think it was 22, 2022, we were praying for a, a place that we would have a focus for missions. And at that time, I was getting to know this guy by the name of Jim Connor, who's larger than life in many ways. And he was making these coffee roasters, which seemed absolutely abstract. Like, what are you going to do with these? And he and Mike were making them, and it's the most delicious coffee I've ever had. So I thought, well, you've got something there. That is incredible. But as we were praying, I'll go from just a little bit of history, but as we were praying specifically right now, I just felt God's heart that you are obedient to the nudging of the Holy Spirit. And a whole community is being transformed by yours and the other's obedience. Here we are, this little church in Perth that people in Honduras would have probably have no idea where it is, no idea what snow looks like and all that kind of stuff. And God is calling us to have an impact in that community and it's because you listen to his voice. And I felt the emotion of it. Um, my wife sometimes teases me that I got all the emotion in our marriage and she doesn't have any. Uh, we're trying to balance that out. But I just, I never cried. And then I asked the Lord to give me tears. And it's like, that's enough. I go through a box of Kleenex way too frequently. But as I was laying specifically hands upon Carrie and Caleb, I just felt tears actually and it wasn't sadness it was just kind of like what we'll hear about with Paul when he talks about the church in Thessalonica you're doing it well and I'm proud of you my children for doing it thank you I remember the first time somebody said thank you to me when I was doing some an event and he didn't quite say it like that he said I really felt the Lord was in the room this morning. And he says to you, thank you. And I was like, well, that's kind of weird. But I thought about it and I thought, why is that weird? Why wouldn't he, the Lord of the church, say thank you when we obey him? Because he says, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. So I honestly believe that this morning there's just this overall to you, the body, part of the body here at Perth. The Lord just says thank you for your ministry and for the impact you're having. I don't know if we say you're welcome back or not, but we are Canadian, so you're welcome. Thank you. First time I said that down in California, the cashier said, what? <laughs> I said, you're welcome. What's that? <laughs> okay, forget it. Scratch it off. But Okay, we're going to talk, talk about Thessalonians. I was teasing Dan when he asked me to do this. I said, this is the hardest book in the Bible, or one of the hardest books in the Bible for me, because growing up I had a lith, and theth sounds, and ethith 
are torture. So when you have a fifth and an F, almost with one vowel in between and that's it, it could be very difficult. But I've practiced and Thessalonians is what it is called. You got that? Thank you, Mrs. Stacy, my space teach, my, what was it called? <laughs> Speech teacher, yes, who taught me how to articulate those sounds. I graduated when I was able to say her name. So Thessalonians, better not brag or I won't be able to get through it. I was intrigued just kind of going back because as we've been going through the various chapters and going through it all, I needed to kind of refresh my memory. Now, I need to do that a lot. And as time goes on, I need to refresh it more frequently. But as I was refreshing it, I actually decided to do what I did the last time I taught. I read the whole book. And I just thought, what's the essence of this? So I want to take you through just some of the highlights of what I saw in Thessalonians throughout the chapters. So the book of Thessalonians, as I understand was one of the, if not the first, it was the first one written somewhere about 20 years after the crucifixion, long before even the Gospels were written. I had no idea it was kind of the first book written, which is why Paul was very emphatic that it needed to be heeded upon by the churches. Paul's writings were sent by him to the elders of the churches, to the church, for use where they were principally designed, following a quote here, with a direction that they should be read publicly by some of the number to the brethren in the assemblies for worship. And that not once or twice, but frequently, that all, and this is what I loved, that all may have the benefit of the instructions contained in them. These words were not for a select few. These words and all the written word is for all to hear. Because God has planted his spirit within all who are his that we may hear his voice and be able to discern it. Fascinating. Many people couldn't read. So why does Paul say, read this out loud in the, in the, in the, in the church? So that everybody could hear it. They learn to hear. We, as a culture, are disastrous in our hearing abilities. I seriously have asked the Lord to help me to listen better. And for the most part, one of the things that I believe he's given me, a tool that he's given me, is that when I'm listening to somebody, I don't formulate a response back. I just listen to what they're saying. So there's nothing calculating in my mind. Unless they're exceedingly boring, and then it's like I have wandered somewhere and I need to come back. But if I'm being intentional and engaging, listening is an art. Listening is a practice. Listening to hear God's voice is a discipline. I was meeting with a couple yesterday, and the guy just needed to go out and hear God. And I said, don't go to your house. You'll wind up doing a project. Don't go somewhere we're familiar. I picture you in a place in the woods where there's a bit of scrappy grass around and a rock. Go sit there and pour your heart out to God. It's a learned skill to listen. So Paul was teaching the church. Teach the church to listen. The word is for all to hear and to live by. So an overview of chapter 1. We won't um, choose specific verses necessarily. But he's, he's thankful for the church. The question I asked when I was opening this book is like, what state was the church in? Because it was one of these ones where he's writing and saying, oh man, you guys have screwed it up so badly. You've just been going down the wrong track. No, he was thankful for this church. The people believed the message that he gave them. They received it with joy and were filled with the assurance of the Holy Spirit that what Paul was saying was true. They believed it, they received it, and made it their own. They became examples to all believers in Greece, and to the surrounding areas. If we boast, let us boast in the Lord alone. But I do want to emphasize just one more time that we are an example to other believers by what we're doing. With Honduras, prayer walking, praying for the town, whatever it is we're doing, 
We are examples of the Lord Jesus. He's not boasting in us. We do it because of his great love for us. Chapter 2, Paul qualifies himself saying that he speaks as a messenger of God, aiming to please God and not the people. He doesn't care what the people think. He fires it straight the way it is, unswavering, not concerned about the political outcome of his words. I know people that absolutely hate the Apostle Paul. And they're Christians. They will say he is arrogant, he is mean, he is rude, he's not loving, da-da, da-da, da-da. I find we say that a lot with authoritative people. They're just not kind. Go ahead, walk in your sin, do your foolishness, live your life in despair, but let me be loving and let you live that way. Is that a leader? No, the gospel is hard. Yes, it's loving because of the one who gave it to us. But it's a hard word. It's a direct word. It's a straight word. And he goes on to preach a a hard gospel in all of his books. In verse 8 of chapter 2, he says, We loved you so much, so it was always done in love. We loved you so much that we shared with you not only God's good news, but we shared our lives with you goes on in verse 20 to say, You, O church in Thessalonica, are my pride and my joy. Okay. That's wonderful. Chapter 3. Troubles come to the church, as they do. And so Paul was wondering, how is your faith holding out? And I, I would just kind of add to maybe a little bit here and say that when he couldn't handle it anymore, he sent Timothy to go there and say, Go check it out. Find out how they're doing. How is the church doing? And the good news that came back was that the church was standing firm in the Lord in spite of its troubles. Just a reminder that Jesus said very clearly, in this world you will have trouble, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. You will have trouble. Why am I having so many troubles? Because you are in the world, and it belongs to a different domain. But one day, That will all change. He writes that he was praying for them, that their love would grow even stronger. I love how Paul, he's kind of like a coach. He is a coach. And he said, you're doing really well, but I pray that you will do better because there's better, there's more. Don't stop where you are at. There is more and there is more. And he prays that God would make their hearts strong, blameless, and holy. Chapter 4, Paul continues to press them to go further. He blesses them for living as they currently are doing so and says, come on, there's more. He says, you live in a way that pleases God, but do even more. This constant warning remains. Stay away from sexual sin and make sure that you are in control of your bodies. Stay away from sexual sin, and make sure that you are in control of your bodies. Verse 7 of chapter 4, he says, God is calling us to live holy lives. That These earthly bodies of ours are to be holy. Automatically, there's an excuse filter. If you've been raised in perhaps an evangelical church like I was, there's an excuse filter. Oh, but we're in the flesh. Yes. But there's teachings on what to do with the flesh, and that's called crucify it. Our part in this great word is I put to death anything that is in his way. That's my part. His part is he gives me the new life. Anyone who refuses what Paul says here, Anyone who refuses to live by these rules is not disobeying human teaching, but is rejecting God. Now, I like to use the excuse, well, you know, I'm, it, but Paul makes it very black and white. If you choose to live pleasing your body and feeling, fulfilling your sexual desires that are outside of God's boundaries, if you choose to do that, you are rejecting God. And he reminds the church again, this isn't laborsome, this isn't cumbersome, 
this is just a small period of time because Jesus is coming soon. Keep that always before you. We are here because of Jesus, and he's coming soon. Chapter 5, Dan was on it last week. He said, the Lord will come unexpectedly like a thief in the night, and we will be with him forever. In verse 12, Paul goes on and says, he urges them to honor their leaders by showing great respect and wholehearted love. As I was reading that verse in review, I thought, Leadership right now, I don't know of a period of time where we have had such great disappointment in leadership. Now, it's quite fun living where I live because I think every single person that lives there is a Harris-Biden supporter. And if you have any other evangelical view, you are beyond a mystery to them. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking not only in leadership in the church here, but what I see is that leadership everywhere has failed. Fathers have failed their families today. I'm not guilting anybody. I have. Grandfathers have failed. Leaders have failed. Politicians have failed. Church leaders, we keep hearing about those that fail. And leaders that work with the church leaders have failed because they let things go on that should never have been going on. And so I recognize how hard it is when you and I have been hurt by leadership that's been wrong. And yet Paul says to us, pray for those leaders. Honor them. And sometimes that's a great work that we have to do between us and God. How do I honor this person? I choose not to curse. I choose to bless. I choose to pray for forgiveness. I choose to ask God to come and speak clearly. But I will not curse them. Even David didn't do that with Saul. He said, honor, respect the Lord's anointed. Even if you don't like what they're doing or who they are. Pray for our leaders, even if we don't like them. I remember hearing a quote from Hillary Clinton. Um, I'm pretty American, so sorry if my news is kind of American, but it happens when you're married to one and you were raised in an American home. Hillary Clinton, do you know what her view of evangelicals was? This is probably 20 years ago. She said, all they do is criticize me. Nobody reaches out in love. Now, that stabbed me because I recognize it's exactly what I do. And I'm not a supporter of Hillary Clinton. I'm sorry, I'm wading into some politics here. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is that she is a lost human being that needs the love of Jesus. Like every politician needs. Like every leader needs. Pray for them. Honor where they have been placed. Honor it. And pray for them. I hope I navigated through that okay. Because it's not about politics. It's about honor. It's about praying. It's about respecting. Be faithful. Paul says, be joyful no matter what you do. And never stop praying. I'm challenged by verse 18 in chapter 5, which Dan talked about last week. Don't stifle the Holy Spirit. Could be more literally translated, stop putting out the Spirit's fire. As a leader, as a failed leader at times, I have put out the Spirit's fire because I don't know what to do with it. And it's not in my control. How strange when I say those words, because whose church is the Lord? Or the, the church, is it mine or is it the Lord's? As a leader, is it mine or is it the Lord's? And if something is of his spirit, will he bring something that will cause pain and turmoil upon what he loves? Don't stifle the Holy Spirit. If you know it's the Holy Spirit, let him do what he wills. Now we're moving into the Latter part of chapter 5, that was just kind of a review. Dan's favorite verse. I am humbled and honored that you left me this verse, Dan, because I thought if it's his favorite verse, I need to treat it with deep respect 
and I need to understand why it's such an amazing verse. It's true, right? You did say it was your favorite verse. One of my favorites. One of your favorites. Okay, got it. So it's one of them. 5 verse 23, reading out of the NLT. Now may the God of peace make you holy in every way, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. Verse 24, God will make this happen, for he who calls you is faithful. Dear brothers and sisters, pray for us. Greet all the brothers and sisters with a sacred kiss. And I command you in the name of the Lord Jesus to read this to all the brothers and the sisters. I have a confession. My dear son printed this out for me and it's missing the next verse. I have a Bible that I bring and I love, but sometimes it's hard to read because I used to be able to read it and it doesn't work the same way it used to. But let's look at that. And may the, I, um, where was I? Verse 27, we're getting there. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Wow. What a great end to a great book. I just want to go and review a few things. Verse 23, I was really st- struck by that may the God of peace make you holy in every way. In the New King James Version, it says, may the God of peace sanctify you completely. Sanctify. Sanctify, it means to set apart, to live as God designed for us to live as. Not in the world. Some of you were raised in perhaps holiness traditions where you were taught what sanctification looked like. And usually it meant some sort of outer form. For me, it was the way I dressed, the way I acted, the Bible I read. There was forms of sanctification. We didn't smoke a cigarette. We didn't say bad words. I'm not saying those are things I would recommend. Those were externals of what we did. But to sanctify is greater than that. It's the heart belongs to to him. Everything I do is his. So Paul just talks so beautifully about body, soul, and spirit set apart. One of the pictures that I read about in description of sanctification was it's like you have a dress, but then it becomes set apart as a wedding dress. And the value of the dress becomes much greater than it was just something off the rack to then it becomes this wedding dress. Well, if that analogy fits with the way that you can think that through, it means that something that is ordinary is then taken to become special, set apart, the common made holy. In the Old Testament, something that was considered holy was actually set apart from the common use, common usage, and put aside. It was tucked away. It was used for God's service over here, not to be touched. But the contrast in the New Testament is the holy or the sanctified is actually common and placed to be used and seen and touched, filled with the Holy Spirit and transformed for God's service. You and I are sanctified, made holy, so that we can be used for God's service. John MacArthur, the preacher down in the States, I'm mentioning all sorts of names, so just uh, pulling out all the good stuff here. Not recommending everything, but I'm pulling out some of the good stuff. He said, a sanctified person bears not only God's name, but bears his image. A sanctified person bears the name of Christ and also bears the image of Christ. Therefore, a man cleanses himself from these things. He will be a vessel of honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. So we offer our human lives to God, and he transforms this ordinary human vessel into something holy to be used by him 
however he sees best. See, the key to that is that God will take you to where you think you never will go. I would never, ever thought I would do, and it's fun to fill in those blanks now. When I was in grade nine, I was so shy and I felt so rejected. I had a teacher stop me in the hallway and he said, do you ever look up off the floor? (laughs) I never realized I did that, but I did that so the guys in the hallway couldn't see if they were making fun of me and bullying me. So I just looked down. I had a middle brother and a sister who were class presidents. And they had all these expectations on me and I was... I wanted to dress the color of the walls so I could be invisible. God can take a broken, screwed up, common, wrecked person and transform them by the power of his Holy Spirit and use them for his glory, however he sees fit. I couldn't imagine that back then I would ever be standing up here fearlessly telling you about the love and power of God. That's the work of the Holy Spirit in a common, ordinary, broken life. So there's no excuse for any of us to say, I couldn't do it. You're right, you can't. It's by the power of God's Holy Spirit that he does it. And chooses whomever he chooses. So Paul in the second part of verse 23 says, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless until our Lord Jesus returns again. So our part is to keep ourselves whole, pure, blameless until Jesus comes. God designed the human to live in this order, not body, soul, and spirit, which is the way most of us live. I didn't feel like doing it, so I didn't do it. I want to eat this. I want to do this. I don't want to get up. Yeah, body rules. No, no. In God's kingdom, spirit rules. The body falls in line with the spirit. It's a different way. So Paul says, may your spirit, may your soul, and may your body be kept blameless. May they be kept pure. May they be kept usable all the time for God's glory. We are to eliminate the things that we think we need the things of the soul eliminate the things of the body so that we are free to live by the spirit now i watch people they're pretty amazing i met this woman a month or so ago named mama maggie who's given up everything and she ministers to the garbage dumps in egypt that's an incredible call i honor and respect her i don't think god is calling all of us to that calling, but he is calling us. What is precious to you? Going through the move that we went through and purging half the stuff that we've accumulated, it means nothing. And watching the little corner house in our community where the woman died and the kids came and the family came and they just gutted it yesterday and just stuck stuff out on the the lawn for people to come and take. We did the same thing. That's not what life is about. It's about living in this perspective that God wants to honor himself through me and through you and that we keep the body, we keep the vessel ready for his service, prepared for whatever he wants. Oswald Chambers, the great author and teacher, says, do we believe that God can garrison the imagination far beyond where we can go? Do we believe, do you believe that God can take you beyond what you can think? Do you believe it? Do you believe you're going to Honduras? That's crazy. You're a country boy, boy. I love that, but you're going to Honduras. Because God can do immeasurably more than we could think or ask. All he requires is, will you give me your life? And will you let me do it? Sanctification, Oswald Chambers says, will cost us everything that is not of God. God will make it happen. I think Dan's second favorite verse is verse 24. It's certainly one of mine. God will make this happen. For he who called you 
is faithful to do it. I remember hearing Andy Fleur, for those that know you, know him. And he said that if God calls you into something, he will provide everything you need for it. Because he's called you into it. And he will supply. It's his problem, not yours. We as humans always bring it down to us like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And I watched with joy as I was meeting with a couple this week and the guy's struggling so hard. Well, how do I give myself to Christ? How do I do this? How do I, how do I, how do I? And I was just like, stop. You can't. You receive this grace and recognize I can't even save myself. I fall upon you and cry out to you and say, here I am. Come Lord Jesus, save me. I can't, but he can. And he who calls is faithful. Faithful, faithful, faithful. God will make us holy in every way. Our lives will be transformed as we live out by the Spirit's power, not in our own strength, but our bodies living and filled with the Holy Spirit. What's the fruit of the Holy Spirit? Holiness. That Jesus, the image of Jesus, is seen. So Paul goes on in verse 25 and says, Dear brothers and sisters, pray for us. I find that fascinating. Here is this mighty man of God surrounded by great co-workers and they're ministering together and he says, pray for us. Well, what does it mean when I ask you to pray for me? I humble myself and recognize I can't do this on my own. I need you to pray for me. We as a church have seen so tremendously the difference between being be, begin praying. I have said this, and I'm sure I've said it publicly here. What happened to me is I fell in love with the town of Perth because we walked the streets on Wednesday and prayed for it. I love this town. I lived in Beckwith for 37 years. I never loved it. I loved it. It was fine. But I've left it and never even thought about it again. Like, Sorry. But I love because I could see God at work. And I love seeing God at work. And that's where we love. So Paul says, pray for us. Why? Because they need our prayers. Leaders need our prayers. I can guarantee that some of the leaders that fell did not have a core of people that were interceding for them. This morning I was on a call with Church Renewal. And there's... 21 people that across the country that are praying for the leadership and interceding for them all week. And we meet every other week just to pray together in unison voices. It's kind of interesting because they actually pray all together at once. I had my phone on. I'm walking down Coburn. I was told it said another way, but I can't say that, so I'll call it Coburn. And I was walking down there and I had my phone on in this prayer call. And all you could hear was a whole host of voices praying. And there's a couple people walking their dog, and you hear this calling out to the Lord, and then this other couple that are jogging by, and I, I just left it on. I thought, how amusing. What on earth is on that guy's phone? It's people calling out to God for them. Now, it wasn't obnoxiously loud, but you could hear this strange kerfuffle of sound. Pray for us. Pray for us. Pray for us as leaders, seriously, in this church. One of the things I heard this morning on that call was Satan likes to take out those that are interceding because if he can get rid of them, he has easier access to those that are being interceded for, the leadership. Oh, he'll come against you. Two nights ago, I was meeting, as I said, I met with a couple yesterday, and I had no idea what I was up against, but two nights ago... I physically felt the presence of the evil one in my room. I have never felt that in 10 years. It is a real war. And I was up against something way stronger. I called out in the name of the Lord last night, no problem at all. And I could clearly see what I was up against. And last night, worship filled the room. And I just, I, I had to go to sleep by turning my phone off. I just couldn't stop worshiping. But there is a war, and if you're going to pray, you will be engaged in the war, and it will be hard. But it holds the leaders in place so they can serve you and proclaim the gospel. 
a great revivalist by the name of Leonard Ravenhill said, the self-sufficient do not pray. The self-satisfied will not pray. The self-righteous cannot pray. And he sums that up by saying, no man is greater than his prayer life. That challenges me. It challenged me yesterday, honestly, last night. I recognize that God is asking my body to come in line with his Holy Spirit. So what does that mean? It means when he says to me, I want you to kneel by the bed, I kneel by the bed. I don't like to kneel by the bed because my room's cold. I don't like being cold. It's inconvenient. So then I'm kneeling by the bed thinking, wow, I haven't done this since we bought this bed. That's been two years. Whoa. And then he says, I want you to lie down on the carpet. Oh, it's got that shag stuff and it tickles my nose. And oh, so I'm trying to find a comfortable place and it's like, nose straight into the carpet. And I just lay before him. Why? Because the one who gave his life for me just asks me a little inconvenience for him. And I want my body to fall in line with that voice. It's not hard in the sense of understanding what to do. It's just hard because sometimes we just don't want to do it. Verse 26, he goes on, greet each other and sis- brothers and sisters with a sacred kiss. And that's been joked about in many different ways. I, I know different cultures. My landlord, when we had our store, was an Italian. When I said that we were going to close our store, in his store, in the Castro's, he came up to me with his exuberantly loud non-British voice. And he, oh, dog, I can't believe. And he's shouting and the whole store is hearing it. And he kisses me one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven times. I thought, goodness, how do I stop this? In his culture, that was love. In my culture, it might be just a side hug. That's okay. It means recognize. As Dan said earlier, when we laid hands on the group going to Honduras, we're family. The body of Christ is called to be a family. And we're not an individual family. We're a family with other like believers here in Perth. And I love that we can do stuff with them and see that we are family because we have one Lord, one Savior, one Christ, and that is Jesus the Lord. We have one who is the head of the church. So then Paul goes on to say, I command you in the name of the Lord Jesus. That sounds very serious. I command you in the name of the Lord That's not to be taken lightly. To read this letter to all the brothers and sisters. Well, why would he command that? Again, as I opened up the talk, beginning of this, it's to make sure that everybody has access to the word of God. If you can't read it, I want you to be able to hear it. There is no excuse for us not knowing. Read this to the church. I love how we read the word of God. I love how we systematically go through it. I love it. I can't escape the verses I don't like. As I said earlier, sometimes I leave them for Dan. That's good. He likes them, does a great job with them. Read this letter, brothers and sisters, and then may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. What a blessing. What an overarching blessing. May the grace of the Lord Jesus, may the favor of Jesus be upon you. We sing that song called The Blessing, and everybody sings it, just rises when we hear it, because there's power in a blessing. I remember hearing about the Jewish culture, how they bless their children. Gentile culture, we don't. They have a strong culture because they bless them. There's power in blessing. Blessing overcomes cursing. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. That's our prayer for you. That's my prayer for me. My prayer is that I live my life out in a way that my neighbors that have very different political views, have very different moral views, 
I still meet with him. I go over Friday night on my own without Linda. And just listen to them. I want them to see the image of Christ in what once was a broken, shattered vessel. And now the glory of God is being seen through those broken places. That's the testimony we have. Sanctified, made holy for the master's use. May the grace of the Lord Jesus be on us all as we live out our lives this way. Jesus, you are so amazing. The grace that you've given us, we can't get our heads around it because we know we don't deserve it. And Lord, I love how you invite me when I fail, which I know I do. And you invite me just to come straight to you, not try to worm my way back or, or fall on the ground and earn it. You just invite me to come and to confess what I've done and recognize that your blood was shed for me, that my relationship with you will always stand. You are faithful to this relationship. Your grace is always. You just invite me to come. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters here this morning as I pray for myself. I recognize that sometimes we can get tired. We were talking about that earlier of just being busy and doing things and then physically just get tired. Spiritually, we get tired and sometimes we don't see results and we lose zeal in praying because we don't see anything happen. And Lord, I confess how easy that is for me to do it, but how you're stirring it up again. Don't settle for the norm. Grow, move on. You are doing this well, Paul says, but move on into higher and better. Always, always allowing you to transform us more and more into your likeness. Lord, I pray not only for this church, but I pray for the churches where the word of God is preached clearly here in Perth. I pray that lives will be image bearers of you and that the world will see you and want you and that revival that we've prayed for will come as they see if God can do this in the life of Doug Sprunt, then God can do it in my life as well. Lord Jesus, we praise you that this is only possible because of the cross. That you died, you shed your blood for every sin that we've committed that was ever committed against us. You've forgiven us for our brokenness, for our sin, for our failures. You've cleansed us and made us whole and put your Holy Spirit in us that we would reflect you. What a powerful, wonderful God we serve. And we say hallelujah. And it all is because of the cross, which we celebrate this morning, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for this bread. Thank you for this cup. And as we worship and just prepare our hearts to take communion with you, Lord, we just thank you for the intimacy we have by your spirit within. I love you. Amen. We're going to, I think most of you are familiar with this, we're going to do a worship song. And as we do so, please... uh, Feel free when you feel it's right to uh, just come on back and get some bread and a cup and come on back and sit down. There will be a few of us back there. If you want prayer for anything, we'd love to pray with you and just bless you as you enjoy this time with Jesus, our Lord and Savior. commands all the hosts of heaven and who else could make every king bow down who else can whisper and darkness trembles only a holy God what other beauty demands such praises What other splendor outshines the sun?
What other majesty rules with justice? Only a holy God. Let's stand together. I love how a holy God takes us and doesn't set us apart so that we are just stuck away in a closet somewhere, but rather he takes us in our humanness, fills us with his Holy Spirit, makes us into his image, and then sends us out to be Christ wherever we are. And that we are made holy because of this. So as we take this bread and we take this cup, we just say, thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for the bread. Let's take it together. And 
for the cup of your blood which was poured out for us that we might be washed, cleansed, and sanctified. Thank you, Jesus. Let's take it together. Dan for those hand signals, which I don't know what I'm supposed to do right now. So over to you, Dan. 